This is The Express with Gary Allen, your 360-degree view of the world. Now, here's your host, Gary Allen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to this edition of The Express. Gary Allen with you. Um, before I introduce my guest and uh, talk a little bit of things, I just want to remind people you can go on Facebook to Gary Allen, A-L-A-N, to say hello to me. You can also remember that on Thursday night at 7 p.m., this program repeats itself on our sister station, thanks to Renee, on Diversity Broadcast Network. That's diversitybroadcastnetwork.com. Also on progressivevoices.com on the Demand Channel. And I believe this Saturday this show will be on 24-7 The Sound Dot com in the morning at 5 a.m., and it also uh, goes out to uh, TuneIn and Google Play and a few other places uh, that are going to happen. Now, before I get into tonight's guest, oh, and by the way, the website is up. It is up. It's still, I got a little bit more to complete. I know this is like an eighth month project, the third person working on it, but it is there at GaryAllenTalkShow.com. So uh, if you want to find out a little bit about my background, For those of you that have been uh, listening to us over the years, you know as much about me as I know about me. But uh, I just want to also thank Randy Jones for tuning in tonight. I know he's out there listening in, as well as all of you for taking the time out of your day to uh, to join us. Before I get into my guest tonight, which is uh, who is Natalie Moore, she's been with us before. I want to bring up something that happened to me on the phone today, and it's been going on now for a couple of months. I got a very strange phone call a few months ago. Uh, someone with a foreign accent, uh, Asian, uh, actually, telling me that they were from Windows and that there was something wrong with my computer. Well, first of all, folks, if you get a call from anybody telling you that they're from Windows, you know it's a con job, okay, because that's not the name of the of the company. That's the name of the product. So if you hear that kind of malarkey, just hang up on them. Or if you can somehow get a, a number, but unfortunately, those numbers usually rotate in and out quick. Well, I got a phone call today. It was a recording, and it was one of those robo kind of calls. And it was basically informing me that my Windows key, which, by the way, when you buy a computer, so make sure your aunts and uncles find out about this, that when they buy a computer and it's loaded in with Windows 7 or Windows 10, whatever is there, it's theirs for life. They have the code key. It's not going to be replaced. It's not revoked. Nothing happens until Microsoft itself decides not to uh, to have Windows 7 or 10 or 5 or 6 anymore, and then they discontinue it, and you have to upgrade to the next level. And I called the 186 number, 866, 866 number, and it sounded like a kid. He answered the phone, sounded like, <coughs> excuse me, a kid in a garage. If you've ever been in a room where there's no padding, like a new home with no carpeting, nothing on the walls, and you hear the echo. So please be careful. Tell your friends out there these cons are going on, and they identify themselves, the one as Windows, which is the product, not the manufacturer, and the other one tells you that your 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 Windows 7 or 10 or whatever is run out of its, its you, you know, you've got to renew, and all they want to do is scam you out of money. So I wanted to bring that to everybody's attention because for my faithful listeners, I, I just want everybody to be aware of that. Tonight we have a very, very interesting guest. And oh, by the way, I hope you've all had a wonderful week since the last time we spoke. Um, this young lady has been on with us before. Her name is Natalie Moore, and Natalie and I become friends very, very quickly. Let me give you a little uh, background on Natalie. Natalie is a marriage and family therapist specializing in relationship coaching, dating, and marriage. After after experiencing and coping with her own divorce, Moore, a Harvard graduate, oh, fabulous, who runs her own financial firm specializing in estate tax planning, went back to school and got her master's degree in marriage and family therapy from my old alma mater, the University of Miami. This book, It's a Match, A Guide to Finding Lasting Love, is meant to be a guide that includes everything that the reader needs to know in order to find the one. If you want more information on relationships, dating, or marriage, subscribe to her blog at www.nataliemoore.net and follow her on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at Natalie Moore Expert. So without further ado, my good friend, 
uh, Miss Natalie Moore, the author of this absolutely wonderful book, It's a Match, A Guide to Finding Lasting Love. Good evening to you, Natalie. Hi, how are you, Gary? I'm fine. I'm I'm bombarded by uh, people trying to con money out of me. Well, you know, it happens even in the dating world. Go figure, right? Yeah, well, you know, and, and the thing is that I was talking to somebody earlier this evening, a friend of mine who doesn't live far from you, my brother Rick down in Miami, and uh, he was uh, saying to me, he said, yeah, I mean, you got elderly people who don't realize that this is a con. You know, no, it's, and, uh, it's terrible. It is. And it turns out to be that it's it, even the gentleman that answered the phone tonight. And I hate to stereotype, but he was Asian. I can tell the voice. I'm you know, that's what I do for a living. I do voices and I do VOs. And so I can tell an Asian voice over an Indian voice or Pakistani or Filipino uh, or, or what part of the Asian world you come from. I can tell. And that's what's going on. They're ripping people off who don't realize that, you know, this is all a con job. All right, let's get to this magnificent book. We're going to cover a lot of territory since you haven't been on be uh, for a while, and we're also going to talk about online dating, which I've always made that funny joke. Um, you you <laughs> said in, in your book, we, uh, we are magnificent beings who are completely deserving of love. Um, yes, we are, but there are also people out there, Natalie, who screw it up every time they get involved in a relationship because of excessive baggage from previous relationships, which is, I guess, a number one reason uh, that they don't have someone on a, on a regular basis that they can call a friend, even if it's not a sexual relationship, just a friend that uh, you, know, you can go to the movies with, have dinner with, so you're not so alone out there besides other friends you may not have you may have or may not have i mean i don't have time for friends i don't have time for anything <laughs> but i mean i really <clears throat> i really don't I, I, when i get off the air here i go right to bed and i'm up at 5 30 in the morning and i'm on my way to the radio station so i mean it's like uh, you know i don't have i don't have a lot of time to myself but is that probably the number one problem with past relation carrying that baggage into new relationships Oh, I think so. Uh, not only that, we come into – when we first start dating, we already come in with baggage because we've been pre-programmed from the time we were little to mm -hmm. have beliefs about ourselves and different relationships and what you deserve and everything else. So once you start dating, you basically are attracting people who validate those beliefs. I mean I found myself – one day you know, after dating all of these people who just didn't work out, I, I realized I was the common denominator in all of my failed relationships. Mm -hmm. So I had to ask myself, because I chose all those relationships, I said, what was it about me that made me continue to choose the same Mr. Wrong? So mm -hmm. it really starts by examining yourself. You know, what is it that if you don't believe you deserve something, you're not, someone good, you're not going to attract someone good. Yeah, you that's true. You're going to put up with a lot of jerks, you know? Yeah, and, and unfortunately, women have to put up with me, so, you know, it's one of those – it's common <laughs> things. Do you think we also go into relationships? I know that as a young man, um, I had a type. Um, right. Now, I, 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 you know, I was talking to my sister not long ago, and I said to her, I said, Jan, you know, I've never dated a redhead in my entire life. She said, well, Gar, mom was a redhead. And I never thought about it like that, but my mother was a redhead. She was dark red, um, and every once in a while she'd color it red, and she'd look like a fire truck going down the street. Uh, but <laughs> you know, she'd get the wrong red. My mother was just, oh, I'll just grab it off. I'm busy. My mother was a very busy, busy, uh, busy woman down there in South Florida. But th is that also a pitfall that we we well, keep going back to the same type over and over and over and over again? Dark hair, blue eyes, uh, whatever the case may be, and it turns out to be. No, it's wrong. Well, you know, it's even more than just body types. Some people do have a, a certain body type or look that they like, but they also have a personality style that they like. And so generally speaking, once you have them describe everybody that they've dated of significance, and then they describe their mother and their father, they will find that they're dating people who have the qualities of the parent with, which, with whom they had unresolved conflicts so th they keep trying to date that parent in a sense mm -hmm. to resolve conflicts and have a better outcome in the relationship so they are stuck on a type 
and it's usually a type that doesn't work, you know, if, it keep, if you keep turning them over. So once you realize that and you know what you're doing, you can stop doing that. Yeah, they, they say that girls marry their dads. And I've always – now my one sister, uh, is she's not going to marry. Uh, she was married, but her husband has passed on. And my other sister is married to a gentleman who is, is pretty cool, but he's nothing like my dad. Um, and besides, I, I wouldn't want them marrying my dad or anybody <laughs> like my dad. My dad was a pretty strict guy, but – um, is that true? We marry our, I mean, for women, I don't know what they say for men. Do we marry our moms? If that's the case, I'm in real trouble because my mom was a disciplinarian, but, um, is that true? Well, I, I really don't think so. I think, uh, what, what you do find is, for example, I had a case a while ago of a young man who kept dating, uh, women who were abusive the way his father was. Hmm. And so he kept trying to get a different result with, from that relationship and, and trying to earn respect from an abusive person, which, of course, you can't. So I think what you end up doing is marrying the one with whom you have some conflicts. And, huh. and it's, of course, subconscious because nobody ever wants to enter into a relationship and end up fighting with that person. But no. we try to resolve these conflicts. So no, so no, and unless, of course, you had wonderful parents and then and you admire your dad then you would choose good qualities like your father had yeah my father was a you know my father was he had a temper and so did my mother they were both born on the same day and they were like two bulls in a china factory sometimes at each other (laughs) i've got some i've got some statistics here that i i gave out the last time you were on and that is the first time marriages that divorce is 66 percent in this country second time marriages for one or the other the divorce rate is 75%. You figure you'd learn from the first one. And it even gets worse. It gets to be like 85% if you're if you're dumb enough to do it the third time. Um, is, is, is In your book, you talk about uh, core values. Is that another thing that, that is never taken into account uh, for the most part? And is it always – I mean the younger kids today – now my nephew Ricky – he married an absolutely lovely young lady, and they've been married for many, many years, and they get along famously. But a lot of people get married for all the wrong reasons, and the core values, which are common interest, religion, sex, work ethic, uh, <coughs> excuse me, children, respecting each other, et cetera, uh, are sometimes missing. And I think the third one is the one that a lot of people get married for. They're all the wrong reasons. They get married for the lustful reasons and never think about, well, you know, what are you going to do after the sex is over? What are you going to talk about? Exactly. Well, you know what happens is um, a lot of marriages end up in divorce. And overall, first marriages are really uh, end up in a 53% of them fail. And it, that's pretty global. And mm-hmm. so what happens is because uh, most people end up in what I call level two relationships, because I, I decided to find out why are these marriages failing and I realized that there are four different levels of relationships, and level one and level two, of course, fail. And what they lacked was um, I found that marriages that had a high number of shared areas of intimacy and core values are the ones that succeed. So in areas of intimacy, well, first of all, what is intimacy? I mean, most people really wonder. Uh, they don't even know what that is. And it's really a journey of mutual discovery between partners. It's a process of moving past discussing just the facts to being open enough to discuss deep feelings, dreams, faults, failures, and needs. And most people just talk about the facts. So, for yeah. example, I, I, I identified the <clears throat> areas of intimacy. It could be social intimacy. Your, what are your emotional needs? Mm-hmm. Your intellectual intimacy. Can you discuss intellectual subjects? A sexual intimacy is not just having sex. It's what do you like? What don't you like? spiritual intimacy so there are 10 different areas so if you have a high number of shared areas of intimacy and core values core values are really the things that no matter what are the most important things in your life so if you can have those shared core values and be able to keep talking about these 10 different areas Mm -hmm. as you develop your relationship and even throughout the years because remember the older we get we keep changing as people yeah, so that's true. You, you have to keep talking to your to your significant other. You know, talking, about yeah. what changes. 
We're talking to Natalie Moore here on The Express. Gary Allen with you. She's the author of It's a Match, The Guide to Finding Lasting Love, um, which has been something I haven't been able to find for, oh, God. Um, and any when we talk about sexual intimacy, you know, the, I, I, I often have talked to many of my friends who have been divorced or who got divorced or who are having trouble in in the bedroom and sometimes what goes on in the bank account also has to do with what's going on in the bedroom but a lot of people i have talked to have problems communicating even with their spouses who have been married for a number of years as to what they really want what really pleasures them how what do you recommend for people to go to therapy uh, for something like that or for therapy for any of this um, you know, common interests, that's pretty normal. Religion, you either are or you're not, and you might even be of two different faiths. But sexual intimacy and what goes on in the bedroom is really important in a relationship. What do you recommend to people that are having problems there? And I don't mean, you know, following through completely to the end. I mean, I'm talking about being pleasured in, in the bedroom. Well, you know, it's interesting because our society, our American society, uh, you know, sex, talking about sex, it's almost taboo. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, I think it's from our Puritan upbringings or whatever. But um, what I would suggest, I mean, sex is also, is also a psychological thing. So if you have to be in the right state of mind and everything else, so when you're having sex might not be a good time to criticize <laughs> So yeah. perhaps, you, you know, you, <clears throat> yeah. you start a conversation, you know, where you see a book on sex and then you go, hey, you know, I'd like to try that or, you know, use it as a prop. Do it in a non, in, an, in a setting that won't put the other person in a defensive position so that they don't feel threatened by their lack of or, you know, you could perhaps, you know, what to talk about and say, oh, these are different things that I'd like to try. What, how about you? Have you have, have any fantasies or anything mm -hmm. else? Just make it more like a conversation right. as opposed to that. But also other things that affect sex is, uh, for example, you, you mentioned the bank account. Mm -hmm. And anything that causes stress in your life, such as, believe it or not, moving, death in the family, uh, financial stress, all of those affect your sex life because you just, you know, you're so drained emotionally that you really don't have enough to give. Yeah. So, so it's also talking about what, what are the stressors that are affecting your sex life. Yeah. You and I have often talked on the phone when I've just called up to say hello, or I just wanted to confirm that you were going to be on. And I know we, we always usually talk for a while. And, and with me, it's just like, you know, I work in radio. It's like minute to minute stressful one situation after the other, and I'm trying to find a balance. And, and lately, the last couple of weeks, I've been feeling blah. You know, I mean, no energy, no anything, no nothing. And it's just we've been going through some changes at the station. And I can and I definitely understand where you're where you're coming from with that. Um, do men have more problems discussing what they want? in a relationship, and I'm not just talking about the bedroom, but in general, as compared to women, because women look at things a lot different than we do, the Neanderthals that we are. Um, do, do, do you ladies look at things a lot different and you're able to communicate those things better? Or does it go back to the old thing when I came home many times and I'd look at my wife and I'd say, what? She says, well, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> That's so frustrating. Um, it is. You know, gen generally speaking, women are – taught to be more emotional but i think our culture has progressed to the point where men are also you know able to speak about their emotions and 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 what they want so i think i mean when you say to somebody oh well if you don't know then you're in your trouble then that means that you also have a problem you know in intimacy you can't talk about emotional intimacy mm -hmm. you know so i th i think um, you know, it's a difficult thing for us to be vulnerable. And so when, we, when we're when we asked, when we're not feeling very comfortable with the other person because we've had all these resentments, it's, mm -hmm. it's harder to expose yourself, unfortunately. But I think that men and women feel it differently. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's why uh, John Gray wrote the book, uh, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, because we do have different styles. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Do you find... The younger generation a little easier on the uh, conversation as to in a relationship 
do you find that they communicate better than, say, our generation? Well, in many areas, they do, uh, because I mean, they just have let go of a lot of the taboos that we, you know we had in my generation, for example. Uh, they're much more open, and they're uh, they look at the opposite sex as equal, and so that really helps relationships. But in other ways, you know, they're immature. They don't yeah. have the the maturity and and the emotional maturity to be able to even know what they're feeling, because yeah. their their life is very technologically oriented. You know, I was talking about that last night here on my local show here in in Coco on uh, 1510 WMEL. I was discussing the fact that all these new social media devices have taken away the opportunities for young people to learn how to communicate with one another and to continue on having conversations because we were discussing blue zone communities. And and, and my two people on the panel agreed that, you know, uh, texting and everything has destroyed the art of communication, the art of writing. You know, everybody texts each other. They don't talk to each other. And and how do you understand someone's inflection when they say, I love you? Really? I mean, it, I know that's simple, but I, I want to hear how the person is saying, I love you or no, I love you, you know. Uh, or, or, you know, I, I like to hear that, you know, I don't like emails either. I like to have a conversation, as you well know. I like, right. to, <laughs> I, I like to talk to somebody to know, you know, what's the inflection? Because that can change a conversation. That could, that could change in a relationship. And I think all these social media devices have really ruined the art of communication and the ability for the young people to communicate with one another and get their message across. Well, you know, it's funny because you, oftentimes I go, I go out to dinner and I watch couples. They're playing on their phones instead of speaking. And yeah. the other night I was out with my son, who was 28, and he was watching this. And he said, ah, oh, this is the degradation of primary relationships, as he said. Well, he uh, said, you know, certainly put it better than I did, that's for sure. And better than I ever did, <laughs> I can tell you that. But I thought it was so funny because, I mean, here they're out on a date. At these great mm-hmm. restaurants, they're not even talking about the food. I mean, they're sitting there on their phones, looking at whatever. So, oh. I mean, how, how much intimacy can you have when you've got this? You know, never mind, you know, texting each other or whatever. These mm-hmm. people are texting other people, so they're yeah. not even present with each other. I mean, it would it would be interesting if they were texting little uh, little naughty naughties back and forth that they don't want anybody else to hear. That's one thing. But yeah, I've often sat. And or watch people at a restaurant, and they and they. But in this case, one time they were talking to each other. They didn't know how to talk. I know. They only well, knew how to deal with social devices. Well, that's exactly it, and that's when I whip out my little list of ten areas of intimacies. Okay, you want to have a conversation? Let's tackle this one. Mm-hmm. You know, how do you like to have affection shown to you? You know, or, or whatever. You know, you can. Everybody likes to talk to feel heard. So when yeah. you ask somebody about what they want or what they like in different areas, I mean, they want to talk about it. Yeah. So I, it's, I, I it's think, time to I, rediscover your spouse or your loved one. Yeah, and I think when you go on a date with somebody the first time, leave your damn cell phone at home. That's you know, right. leave it at home. And if, 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 you're, if the person you're with has one, say, you know, can we put that aside, you know? I, I did, I went out with a girl in Vegas. Natalie, I'm telling you, we're talking to Natalie Moore, the author of It's a Match, a Guide to Finding Lasting Love. Uh, You can get more information about Natalie by going on nataliemoore.net. She has a wonderful blog on there, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. She's a dear, dear friend of mine. Uh, At least she went to one college that I like, the U. Um, Although Harvard wouldn't dare accept me, that's for sure. But I went out with I went out with a young lady in Vegas. She was an agent, and we 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 were attracted to each other. But every five seconds, while we're sitting in there having dinner, the the phone would go off. And I finally said to her, I said, "Look, can can you just kind of turn that off and put it away for a while?" She said, "You know, I wish I could, but if I miss one of my boss's calls or something." I'm in real trouble. And then about two minutes later, she said, but you know, the hell with it. It's 10 o'clock at night, you know, and whatever it is, it can wait till the morning. And, you know, I think sometimes people are afraid to say to each other, would you put that device away so we can actually get to know each other? And even if you do know each other, we're on a date, but let's shut the rest of the world out and think about you and me for a moment. No, I agree. I think the phone, <laughs> I mean, the cell phones, uh, 
create a compulsion in people just to answer them. Oh, yeah. I mean, how many people, times do you see people just like holding their phone and just checking emails every two seconds? I mean, nothing much has changed, you know, from the last time you looked at it. And yeah. something like, so w- what I always did was um, I, t- I would turn my phone in silent, but I would keep it out and I would only answer it if it was one of my, my two children. And because, and only because I knew that there would be a problem because they, if they knew I was out, they weren't going to be calling me just for nothing. So that I always said, I don't answer the phone unless it's my kids. And then I get them off as quickly as possible. Yeah. I mean, cause so, you're out having fun with people and you don't want to be right. bothered. You know, you, the, right. the, the, the nine to five world is gone. I'm now out with my husband and I'm enjoying life and, and, uh, all, all the stuff that, that, that goes along with that. Uh, I just wish I could find somebody. I just don't have the time anymore. I know you've always told me, Natalie, but Gary, you can find the time, and um, which is going to bring us to our next part of this discussion. But wait a second, uh, hold on. Let me interrupt yeah. here. Yeah. The fact that you don't that you don't make the time <laughs> also indicates that some part of you really doesn't want to be with someone because where are you going to fit that person in? I uh, that's true. I mean, it's true. And 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 since I moved over here from Orlando, I've certainly met. A number of ladies that I would like to date. I did go out on a date, uh, but she was busy. I'm busy, and just we just don't have the time. Uh, and, and there are other people I meet. I get a phone number, and then I realize I don't have the time for this. I just, you know, I get I get one day off a week because um, I'm up very early, and I even work on Saturdays. I produce a show, and I just don't have the time. You know, as soon as I'm through with this show tonight, I start working on next week's shows, and and you know, and, and I just. You know, and maybe I just don't want to make the time. I don't know. I, I know that I know that you and I've talked about this before, Natalie, that I'm just not looking for anybody. You know, I think that's probably more accurate because you do. You have lunch, you have breakfast and mm-hmm. and dinner. So even if it's for an hour, you could you could make the time if you really wanted to. Yeah. And so, uh, I mean, I I had a case where a young lawyer was telling me, oh, I really want to find the one. But. You know, this this is my my schedule. I said, okay, well, where are you planning to fit in this eighty hour week that you have? Where are you planning to fit in your date? Well, I don't know. So then I said, well, then I don't think you're going to be finding anybody because you don't have a place in your life. So that's something to really examine. Are we really scheduling ourselves out, you know, uh, and preventing ourselves from having a love life, mm-hmm. or do, or does it mean that we really don't want one? We just say we do. Yeah, I I think we get comfortable. As you get older, because you're looking for certain things that you didn't when you were 20 and 30 years old. Right. And I think you get kind of set in your ways and you get into a comfort zone and it's sometimes hard to get out of it. Now, I, I'm certainly look. I mean, I really if, if I met that right person, I would make the time that may be part of it, too. I'm older and I'm just not looking for the bada bing, bada boom kind of a relationship. I'd like to have some <coughs> excuse <clears throat> Excuse me, folks. <clears throat> I've had trouble well, with the you. cold now for a couple of weeks. Um, I'm looking for somebody that's a little bit deeper than just the uh, bada bing, bada boom, and oh, let's go to the movies and stuff like that. And maybe that's part of my problem. Which brings up the next part of your discussion that we've been wanting to get to, and we we've skimmed it the first couple times you were on, and that's uh, online dating. And Great. I have I have as you told as I told you. I have seen many of my friends do this. I have also, uh, I've never tried it. I made a joke about it once that you laughed, and so did some members of the audience, because I heard from them later when you had asked me off the air if I ever tried online dating, and I said, bada bing, does watching porn count, of which it doesn't. <laughs> but, right. but but actually, for some people, that is their dating. I, I have come to find out. If you take a look at the five billion, I saw something online: five billion dollar industry in the United States alone is adult and, entertainment. And you know what? The best thing is you don't have to interact with anybody. No. So, th- no. so that person who you're fantasizing about never has never has a bad mood. You know, no. is always looking beautiful. Everything else, uh, you know, that's the problem really with porn because yeah. a human being can never live up to that person who always looks great and is never in a bad mood. Yeah, I think if you keep it in perspective, like watching movies, as I did as a kid, and then realizing when you grew up that life isn't really like movies, there may be a lot of similar scenarios 
but but the outcomes are not always so grand and the uh, you know, as you may think. Um, you are working on a workbook, I believe. Are you not dealing yes, with? Yes, I'm working. Day? Yes, you know, for me, I I think online dating really became the game changer. Once you move past your twenties, when it's very easy to meet people, and particularly in college and and right after. Uh, you know, people get busy with their careers, as we, you and I just discussed. So what happens is busy people, um, you know, don't go out to the bars during the week. And no. after a certain age, if you're hanging out in bars during the week, it probably means you have an alcohol problem. <laughs> so, you know, that's not necessarily the one I want to meet, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, you know, it's so funny you bring it's funny you bring that up. I'm 64 and, and you know what I look like. I mean, I'm not exactly God's gift to women as far as the looks oh, department. It. But if if I'm hanging around at a bar at 64, they go, oh, look at the dirty old man. Yeah, look at the dirty old guy over there. Look out, watch out. You know, um, yeah, you 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 got a problem. You you really really do. You really do. Um, but yeah. So what's the so what's the answer to all of this? Because you got to go through an awful lot of bad situations to get to the good one. Well, you know, I I actually. <laughs> Wrote the, it's a matchbook, and I'm doing the um, the workbook because I was that person who actually started dating online, and I had such disastrous results mm. that I quit. And so I said, "No, wait a second. You know, hold on. I know about this stuff. I'm not applying my knowledge. I'm doing just doing all of this randomly." So then I started like making, figuring out the science of this and analyzing the different aspects. Yeah. So that I could be successful, and then I decided to share that with. But you know, the, the online dating because busy people are, but you know, when they come home from work, they're tired. But if you can spend an hour a day, you yeah. know, uh, from your living room, mm -hmm. finding the right person, you know, and and working on doing the right profile and and doing all of the things that you're supposed to do, which I will outline and I've outlined in my other book. Basically, you can find the one, and find, and because you're exposed to people, millions of people every day mm -hmm. for an hour. I mean, you can find people you would never have met. Yeah. And so, but the thing is, you have to really know the rules and the protocols. What works? What doesn't work? How do you read between the lines of of a profile? For example, most people will tell you really what they want mm -hmm. on a profile. And if somebody has a very skimpy profile, it means that they're just trolling. Mm. It, they, you know, they're not seriously looking for somebody. Uh, you know, but most men in particular will always say what they want. And a woman, mm. it, well, if she reads my book, she'll say what she wants too. If she's looking for a committed relationship leading to marriage or whatever, she'll put it out there. Does the financial just give, hmm? does the does the financial aspect? play into it because more and more women now of uh, the younger generation and even of our generation are making more than men do. How does that play into it? Well, I think it depends on, on the two people and how they view that, you know, it, relationships now. I mean, I have a very good friend who makes more money than her husband and has for years, but he's much better at, for example, at supervising the son. I mean, he works also, but if she has a job where she flies all over the place. Mm -hmm. So they share the raising of their child and they share duties in the relationship that, that are way more valuable than money. Yeah. It depends on how you look at, you know, how you look at things. And I don't think, um, you know, most people who are progressive mm -hmm. don't, don't worry about who makes more. It's yeah, and that, if, all, if all the other things work out, you know. <clears throat> yeah, that was a problem in my relationship, my marriage. Um, when I first got married, I was working two jobs um, as a young actor and comedian in L.A. And Grace was working in the advertising business. She was making more than I was. Then she got laid off, and I was working, and that was fine. Uh, then we moved from L.A. to Chicago, and. I wasn't working at all because I went back to school a little bit, and it bothered me. It 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 hit that core, where for a while it was okay. For a couple of months it was okay that Grace was working and I wasn't. I I I I did find a part time job, but then after a while, 
maybe it was my generation I was brought up in where the man is the man and the woman is the woman kind of BS that's it's since forth left the, the barn. But it did bother me and it did interrupt our relationship. And we had fights, not not knock down, drag out fights, but I was moody and I wasn't happy with myself because I guess down deep I wasn't proud of myself. Well, you know, I think you just hit the nail on the head because it was all about you and how you thought about it. Mm-hmm. And if I mean, if you were doing something else and you had discussed with her, I'm going to go to school now. Is this OK? Can you, you know, can you right. carry us for a while? And she agreed with it. Then I think that it was really all about you. I mean, it was, yeah. your your perceptions and all of that. But I think the younger generation now knows basically that they have to work together as a team. Because, I mean, things are just different now. Yeah. And costs are different and everything else. Oh, yeah. But all of those things, you know, if you write a good profile, exactly what kind of person she's looking for or, you know, <laughs> the woman can see what, what he's looking for. Right. But the, also the other thing about online dating that's very important is you have to learn what to say and how much to say in, in order to stay safe. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of things to keep you safe online as well we're talking to uh, one we're talking to natalie moore the author of it's a match a guide to finding lasting love you're listening to the express i'm gary allen natalie uh let's let's talk about um some of the do's and don'ts about online dating uh i see the uh the ad for the old guy that has the online dating thing but i understand some of the applications are many, many pages thick. I mean, do people really want to sit there and fill out an application that takes them an hour and a half? Well, I, you, I think you're talking about eHarmony. Yeah. Because that's the one that does that. I mean, my my personal feeling when I worked with it, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it has a very good reputation and they have their reasons for doing it. I decided to to do it, the whole thing, and it took a long time. A lot of people get turned off by it or don't answer all of the questions. But what's also interesting about that is when somebody's responding and communicating with you, they can see how you answered every single question. Mm. So that's something that I was not aware of when I did that. And so somebody made some comment like, oh, you don't believe in legalizing marijuana or whatever. I'm like, yeah. how did you know? You know, how did you, where did you get that? Right. And I realized, so um, now, for example, Match.com, they have a lengthy profile that where you get to write a lot of things in there. And I think that if you're seriously looking for somebody, you're going to take the time because mm. you you don't want to waste your time. Right. So you want to put in all the things, you know, just so that people get a feel for who you are mm-hmm. and also what you're looking for. And what so, you really look like, not not some fake picture from 30 years ago. Oh, my God, yes, or 20 pounds ago. So, yeah, or, or it's not even you. It's somebody else. It's your cousin Vinny or somebody. That's right. Well, usually what I – I mean, obviously I went on a lot of dates and stuff when I was, writing, when I was researching my book and everything else, and um, I kept hearing stories, I mean, that were just, I mean, amazing about this. And I don't know how people really think that mm. they're going to get past – you know – the basis of any good relationship is honesty and trust, right? So if you start by lying, by not divulging that you're really 20 years older, um, I think that that's a bad, pro- that's a problem. I mean, you could maybe put, lower your age for search engine thing, uh, reasons, but maybe when you speak to that person on the phone, say, look, I want to be upfront with you. I'm really this age. I just did that for, you know, I feel like I I look younger and I wanted somebody younger, so I put that up there. As long right. as you disclose up front, I think it's okay. But when you start um, a relationship by lying, by showing the wrong picture or everything else, and then having the guy find out when he shows up at the bar, yeah, uh, that's yeah. that's not very honest. Do a lot of these dating sites, um, online dating sites, do they screen the people and do they are they able to? find the the, the the real perverts and the the ones that are trolling that are not really serious about a relationship can they screen them out and not have them part of the uh, the group that you would look at 
No, because there are actually people online who just want to troll also. So, for example, if you just want to hook up, you just yeah. find somebody else who wants to hook up. Mm-hmm. So, online, I mean, basically, it, it says what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. So, if you're looking for a committed relationship, you look only for those people. Right. If you're looking for a date, that's something different. Mm-hmm. And so, they're all there. You just have to be able to read it. Mm. What was your worst date that you had when you were out there? Oh, well, well without mentioning say, names. No, of course I wouldn't do that. Uh, per se, I didn't really have a <clears throat> bad date because I did a lot of pre-screening. Mm-hmm. So before I actually met with the person, I had already Googled that person to see who they were. You know, if they, they were really who they were supposed to be, you know, and then you can see if they have a criminal record. All of those things show up on Google. Uh, but one time before I actually did the full Google on the person, I'd spoken to the person. They sounded really great. It mm-hmm. turned out when I met the person, the, uh, the person had never told me that they had a child, number one, and that the, and the person was like 10 years older than what. He said he was. Right. So at this meeting, of course, and I was, and I had specifically said I was, I was not interested in somebody with young children because my kids were grown up at that point. Mm-hmm. So I, at the meeting, he says, "Oh, by the way, um, I have a nine-year-old child." I'm like, "Okay, well, that's fine." Mm-hmm. And then <clears throat> when I, I said to him, "Oh, by the way, what's your last name?" You know, when we were walking. He turned around. He was really angry. Why are you going to Google me? And that, and he just mm. like turned at me. I mean, I was like, uh oh, no, I hadn't thought about that at that Uh-oh. point. But now I'm going to do that. Yeah. And, yeah. and what I found out really were all the discrepancies. So I, I mean, that was my first lesson. And you don't go on a date until you have that person's last name, first name, and last name, and then you find out about them. Your your makes. Yeah, your book, your the book that you're coming out with on online dating, the booklet. When will that be available for people to um, to purchase? Probably over the next couple of months. Uh, yeah, I've had other projects that I've been working on, and so uh, I haven't been able to to get it out there yet. I have I have a lot of it's been formatted, but it's just the uh, finer details have oh. to come out. But a lot of the base, you know, what I've done is. My section on online dating on it's a match. I've actually expanded that set, that section, mm-hmm. and and made made them into exercises so that people could really, you right. know, put out a good profile. But also the other thing, uh, you know, in the it's a match, I put a lot of red flags that you should look for if you see this or hear this behavior. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, look out and walk on by. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and there, there are a lot of people that have got some crazy stuff. Uh, does your book go into how you read between the lines of uh, his or her profile? Oh my, yes, of course. Uh, as I said, people usually tell you what they want, uh, and they some are more explicit, and others are more implicit in the sense that you have to read between the lines. Mm-hmm. So, for example. <laughs> uh, uh, prince looking for his princess. You know, huh. when somebody says that, and believe me, there are a lot of there are n- number of profiles out there saying that. Oh, I God. mean, this guy is looking for a damsel in distress that wants to be rescued, or uh, you know, I mean, you see all of these things, and they're mm-hmm. um, and it, it's just really amazing <laughs> what people put out there. And so it, it, I have it, the red flags okay. and how to read, and I take certain I take profiles and excerpts of profiles. Mm-hmm. And then explain them to you what they mean. And what's what's the most dangerous part about online dating? If there well, is, well, I think a- it. I think it's all. I mean, obviously, there are there are cons. Look, online you find what is offline. So just like you could meet somebody in a bar who's a con man, mm-hmm. you'll find that online as well. So basically, you follow the. You don't put, for example, I never put, you don't put pictures of your house, uh, of your children, right. or even of your car or possessions or anything on there. And you don't say, oh, by, I'm super wealthy or whatever. 
right. uh, because then that makes you a target. Just like you wouldn't tell anybody in a bar th- those things either. Uh, so I think that th- that and it's really finding out who you are dating. In right. the bar, when you meet them, you get a imp- first impression. Well, the first impression here is what are they writing? What does their picture look like? And then immediately move to a phone call because you can right. really tell a lot of, uh, on the phone. Uh, sometimes people have other people write their profiles, but in two seconds you'll be able to figure out if he wrote the profile. Hmm. And then I have a, you know, I suggest questions that you t- you ask while he's on the phone. Right. So really, you want to get to know as much as possible <clears throat> before you actually meet that person for a right. coffee date. I have a terrible problem writing about myself when uh, when I was putting together the bio for the new website. And uh, other things. Now, the gentleman who's working on my website now is an old friend of mine, so he knows me pretty well. And I have a terrible time, Natalie, of describing myself or um, writing anything about myself. It's it's not that I, I, I probably can if I'm forced to. I just don't know the right things to say that – I mean I've got a big enough ego, but I just don't <laughs> know how to put it into words to say you know, Gary's this or Gary's that. It sounds so narcissistic. Well, you know what I I think a good technique to use is pretend you're your best friend describing you. Mm-hmm. And so and write it as though, you know, like I'm describing you as such and such and such and such. You write that about yourself. Mm-hmm. What would your best friend say? Just start writing it. Oh, boy, you don't want to know that. You don't want to know well, that. Well, the, the things, the things that are for public consumption, I would say. Oh well, no. Even for that, you don't want to necessarily know that either. I mean, <laughs> you know, remember, I was in show business for a long time in my life in in Hollywood. We're uh, we're talking to uh, Natalie Moore, the author of "It's a Match: A Guide to Finding Lasting Love." You're listening to the Express with me, uh, your host Gary Allen, and I'm glad you're with us. Um, what is the most important part about those first emails? back and forth in beginning the conversation? Well, you want to create a connection with the person. So some of the things that you might, let's say if you write, if the person writes to you and says, oh, you're beautiful or hi, beautiful, or something about your body or, Mm -hmm. or something that's obvious. I found many, uh, your profile interesting. That usually means he didn't really read it. Okay, yeah. so that guy is fishing. So what I think, uh, what I like are the pro- somebody, if you want to write to the person, find something in their profile that's interesting. Oh, you know, I, I see that you like to, um, to go scuba diving. I like that too. Mm-hmm. You know, and find something in common, create a commonality. And yeah. then ask them something about their own profile. So that, you know, it creates a natural a feedback so that he he can answer with something that you want to know. Are there red tags, as you call them, uh, parts of the discussion at the beginning that once you hear that, you should get up and walk away, not maybe literally, but figuratively in your mind? I mean, if sex becomes a part of the conversation right off the bat, is that a danger sign? <clears throat> well, usually, you know, people who ask inappropriate questions, uh, you know, like if in a bar somebody said to you, uh, what's your favorite sex position, sexual position when oh. you just meet them? <clears throat> you know what I mean? You would know that that's inappropriate. So that's, a big, that's an obvious red flag. Mm-hmm. But also anybody who tries to ask you about your financial position, uh, you know, uh, anything like that, that would just – you have to pay attention to your, you know, your intuition. Yeah, I hate you, that when you'll, people – You yeah. feel it. Yeah, I, I, there was a time back when I was in my 30s where uh, these young women were always saying, so what do you do? I mean, I was living in L.A. at the time. What do you do? Are you a producer? Are you a director? You know, and, and, and by the way, asking your favorite sexual position was calm compared to what some of their, the ladies would ask you uh, in L.A., what they would do to get in television or in the movies. Um, it's unbelievable. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't answer those questions. I mean, uh, you know, I... Uh, if you're anybody, they don't need to, you know, they know who you are anyway, but I mean, yeah. But are, are there things that should never be brought up online? Uh, 
Well, I mean, basically anything that you <laughs> wouldn't say to a person in, in person in a bar mm-hmm. when you first meet them, because you you know you would become a target. Like for example, you wouldn't mention where you live. Somebody says, "Well, where do you live?" I mean, okay, I could say a general thing, Coral Gables, for example. I could say that, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to say I live on such and such a street. You know, or where do you work? Like in the profile, I tell people what I do, but I don't say where I work. You mm-hmm. see what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you know, what I do is also part of, you know, what, what my interests are and everything else. But I don't say, for example, I work at FPNO <laughs> or something like that, because that puts you in a position that if somebody could stalk you. Yeah. So you want to you want to make sure that you don't divulge enough until you meet that person, and, uh, you know, at a, over coffee or over a glass of wine or something and decide, OK, this person seems OK. Mm-hmm. And even then, you drive yourself there, and you do it in a public venue, mm-hmm. so that you feel safe. So yeah. I think that it's the same. The same rules apply to online dating mm-hmm. um, that apply to when you meet somebody in a bar. Yeah, I mean that's really, Are they, you know if it feels off, it is off. Right. Is online dating also ideal for people that are high income? Always on the go, workaholic types. Oh, of course, because it's the most efficient way to meet people. You, you know, as I said, in an hour a day from your living room, you can be looking at millions of people. Yeah. And you can be culling through them. And so, for example, you if once you learn how to do, use the search engine, you can put in a whole bunch of variables and have the search engine find people who meet all that criteria. So therefore, I'm sorry, I've, I've got a cold too, so my voice is going. Uh, yeah. But uh, so once you have those people, it's a lot easier than going into a bar and, you know, trying to find people who meet all that criteria. So it's more are there, efficient. Are there websites? Are there dating sites that you say stay away from? Like, I would never answer anything on Craigslist. Uh, oh no, there- of course not. I mean, are there who do we are, who do you recommend? I mean, if someone comes to you, a friend of yours, and says, <clears throat> "Natalie, I want to try this." Uh, what are the two or three or one websites that you recommend for that I could feel safe and secure on to a certain extent? Um, and, and oh, and and one thing that just just came to me: what bit of information should you never put on there, even though they ask for it? Is it your income level or anything like that, or should you just kind of give a generality? Well, usually the questions that the that the site asks are good questions, and you should answer them. Mm-hmm. And but you know, trying to be appropriate. Uh, the income levels they ask about brackets. Uh, uh, you know, they give you brackets, and I think the top ones usually like over a hundred thousand or something. Well, so I'm it's out. It's not like they're asking. You to, no, but it's not like they're asking you to make over a million dollars or something. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so a lot. So I think it's it's good to answer all of the things. Uh, again, you know, being careful because everybody's reading it. Um, I, and I think that the site that you use really depends on your age. I think for anybody really over 30, 35, or even 40, mm-hmm. I, I, the big ones, uh, Match.com, OkCupid, uh, eHarmony, uh, mm-hmm. those are really reputable. They have huge uh, audiences. So what you want to make sure is that they have a lot of people, a lot of people and they in give, and, area. and they give you, yeah, they give it's, it's broken down into your area. Obviously you're not going to want to date somebody in Houston, Texas, if you live in Miami, Florida. Right. Exactly. Unless I don't mind traveling a lot. Or and, you're, or, or you work for the airlines. Exactly. And so, I mean, I had a girlfriend who, in Miami who met her significant other on match and he lived in Germany. Oh. And they, they visited each other a whole bunch of times, and he moved to Miami uh, to get to know her, and they've been married for a long time now. Well, there, there's a culture shock, Germany to Miami. That, that's, a, so, that's, that's a real culture shock. We've got a, about uh, six minutes left uh, in, in the program. Um, Natalie, when it, you know, your book that you wrote, It's a Match, The Guide to Finding Lasting Love. How many people who have read this book have contacted you and said, yes, thanks to you, I was able to find 
someone in my life that really I love and adore? Well, many, it hasn't been out long enough to develop a full relationship, but many people have written to me and said, oh, my God, I, I wish I had known all of this like a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Because, and really, I mean, I, I wish I had known everything that I know now when I was in my 20s because yeah. it would have saved me a lot of. Yeah, lot don't of, we all. Yeah, don't we and, all. Yeah. Exactly. And so what I wrote on there were things that as a marriage and family therapist, that patients would ask, and, pro- mm-hmm. and and the same pitfalls that I saw everybody falling into, I wrote this. I gave uh, I give relationship advice. You know, how do you manage? How do you argue? All of those things are in that book mm-hmm. because it's after you meet me. Uh, it's a really about finding, getting, and keeping the person. Right. So once you get the person, you have to keep them. So I well, give you those tools as well, so that you can yeah. have a successful relationship. We're talking to Natalie Moore, the author of It's a Magic Guide to Finding Lasting Love. How would you describe if someone said, uh, give us a description of a loving, lasting, healthy relationship? Well, I would I would refer them to my chapter on the four levels of love. Mm-hmm. And I would say read about the, uh, the level three and level four relationships where basically they have a high number, uh, a high um, – their shared areas of intimacies and core values are great. And as well, the, and the fourth level really has almost like, like a soulmate kind of component to it. Like you just know. Plus you have all those other things to back up your relationship. So I, something that I call almost like your divine partner. Right, so that's right. the fourth level. But the third level is, you know, basically the, the high number of shared uh, areas of intimacy and core values. And then, of course, I mean, all the things that fit, like when you're, already, when you're past 30s and you're more set in your ways, it's also how well do you live together? Mm-hmm. You know, your habits can make you or break you unless you are easygoing and can tolerate a lot. Yeah. What so, do you want people to take away? We've got about a minute and a half left. What do you want people to take away from uh, this book? That finding and keeping lasting love is possible for everyone and i promise you that if you do everything in the book you can find your lasting love she's natalie moore a good friend of mine she's the author of it's a match the guide to finding lasting love one of these days i hope i hope to do that natalie thank you so much for joining us here and thank you i'm so glad we were able to connect this time the last few times uh something kind of got in the way each time that we couldn't uh, couldn't have you on the program and if you want more information on Natalie, go to her blog at www.nataliemore.net. Follow her on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at Natalie Moore Expert. Natalie, God bless you. Thank you. And tell that handsome Thank husband of yours that I send my hello. And I wish Thank you all you the best. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye now. And I want to thank all of you out there for taking a few minutes out of your day to join me here on The Express. It has been really fun to be with you tonight. I apologize for my voice a little bit. Again, don't forget on Thursday night at 7 p.m., Diversity Broadcast Network uh, repeats this show again. Go to Progressive Voices. YouTube will have it up on Friday. It will also be on uh, on a couple of other networks as well as uh, – It'll be on 247thesound.com. So I just want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your day to join us here on The Express. It means a great deal to me. And for all of us here, and EW, thank you so much back in the studio. And until next time, please take care of yourselves and each other. You've been listening to The Express with Gary Allen. Join us here every Tuesday night at 10 for more captivating talk with Gary Allen. See you next time on The Express.